I suppose some of the most profound verses in the Bible are found in Romans chapter 8. Listen to verse 27. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. All right, so the one who knows us inside out also knows what the Holy Spirit knows is God's intention for us, what he intends to make of us. And just as the Spirit moved over the waters in the first creation, he's the one who moves in our hearts to accomplish the transformation. If you can only imagine the difference between the earth without form and void and then full of every perfect a flower and fruit and animal and bird and fish and to see the magnificence of that first creation. If you can understand the stark contrast between those two, you'll begin to understand what the Spirit knows God wants to make of us in the new creation. And so this plan of God's to transform me, if you were to ask yourself, how many changes do you think have to be made between me now and me like Christ? If you can imagine all the changes that occurred in the first creation through the simple statements of God when he spoke about all the grasses and all the herbs bearing seed and all the fruit bearing trees and all the fishes of the sea, the swimming creatures of the sea, and all the flying creatures of the air, and all the animals that crawled on the face of the earth. Imagine all of the changes, the changes in the heavens for the stars that shone, the sun and the moon, everything that changed, all of the mechanisms, the uh, hydrologic cycle, and everything that was involved in setting up the movements of the heavenly bodies. That's what it took for the first creation. What will it take for the new creation? Now, the great thing about the gospel is that God has guaranteed the finished product. He has told us right from the beginning, when we preach the gospel, the gospel not only pays the penalty of our sin, not only delivers us from the power of Satan, but guarantees that ultimately we will be like Christ, that we will fit in in heaven. We will bear the image of the heavenly. And so the passage goes on to say, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You've maybe heard the phrase. It's often ascribed to John Lennon. He stole it from somebody else, uh, maybe Fernando Sabino, a, a Brazilian writer. Everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Now, the unbeliever can't say that. There's no guarantee of that. In fact, in the end, it will be the ultimate tragedy for those who reject the gospel. But according to this verse, we can say, we know all things in the end will have worked for our good. And if some of these things have not yet worked for our good, it's not the end. There are things in your life and they still look very messy and they still bring heartache and they still seem to be shrouded in darkness and you can't figure it out. Those are the things the Spirit of God knows are the necessary pressures and forces and agents that he is using because he knows what God wants to make of you. And the intercessions that you, the groanings of your heart, he is translating those into requests that exactly match the will of God for you. And so we can say this, that all these things are working for our good, and if some things now still seem to be not doing that, 
we know that it's not the end. And that in the end, we will see he has done all things well. He will be able to say over that creation, over you as a new creation, what he said over the first creation, very good. And he will say, very good. I am pleased. He will see of the travail of his soul. Let me make it perfectly clear. Whatever you're going through, he's going through it with you. You are part of his body. He doesn't just have a good memory. Remember what it was like 2,000 years ago to live on the planet. He is going through it with you. As the poet wrote, in every pain that rends the heart, the man of sorrow has a, has a part. The man of sorrows is going through it with you. And so he is, by the Spirit of God, molding you and changing you. And all of these changes, and with me, it has to be massively dramatic to change me to be like the Lord Jesus. But this is the gospel we preach. A gospel that not only proclaims redemption, but transformation and ultimate glorification. And that's all the gospel. The gospel is everything that God has for us in Christ. Now, just a brief story. I transferred to our university in my hometown to save money, stay at home the last year or two of my studies. And the years before, the Christian group at the university had been infiltrated by universalism, Unitarianism, and had corrupted the whole gospel effort. And so they had disbanded. And my brother-in-law was a student there, Bob Cretney. He was influential in getting some of the believers together. And we began to move again in the gospel. And it was a marvelous thing to see how God worked and souls were getting saved and lives transformed. Well, what happened was that some of these young people were going back to their liberal churches and saying, what's with this? Why haven't you been telling us this? Because they were seeing that their lives now were being transformed by the gospel. One of the big drinkers on campus um, was gloriously saved and became an outspoken evangelist. And really, God used him in a mighty way to bring the gospel to the whole campus. And so these young people were going back to their liberal churches, and two of these churches, an Anglican church and a United church, they asked to meet with us to find out what's going on. And so we were able to sit down with them and simply explain to them, this is the gospel we're preaching, a gospel of total redemption, absolute assurance, complete security, and ultimate transformation. And this is the only gospel worth preaching. And one of the men in one of the churches, after we gave our little talk, he said, you know, we've tried the social gospel. We've tried the liberation gospel, the new perspective gospel, the kingdom gospel. Maybe we need to get back to the Bible gospel. Well, that's what we have to preach the Bible gospel. And what is the good of verse 28? All things work together for good. Not necessarily our financial good, not necessarily our physical good, nor our societal good. But what is the good? Well, the good, which we read that we have been called according to his purpose, is found in the next verse, verse 29. He has predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. God can't think of a better thing to do than to make us like the Lord Jesus. And so while the world bluffs their way through and says everything will be okay in the end, we know that's not true. But we do know for the believer it is true. We know that all things in the end will have worked for our good. And that good is our transformation, not only to look like Christ, to bear the image of the heavenly, but to actually think like him, to want what he wants, and to be able to live a life that is 
identical because it will be his life fully in us. So that if everything in my life yet hasn't already worked for good, some tragedy, some sorrow, some bereavement, some failure, yes, even some sin, if I haven't seen God yet pick up the broken strands and work them into this new tapestry, this new portrait of Christ worked into my life, well, then I know it's not the end yet. Because in the end, not only will we know he's altogether lovely, we will know that he has done all things well. 